Good morning, my friend. This is uh, Monday morning here in Grand Junction. Just left that Airbnb right behind me uh, for the day. I'll be here for the week. Anyways, uh, this is Grand Junction. This is just a residential section here of town, uh, kind of the old part of town. And so we're gonna head up to, uh, where am I gonna head up to? 12th and North. I'm gonna see if I can find some breakfast on the way. Uh, there's a couple of restaurants that I know of. Uh, this is my fourth trip to Grand Junction and um, I'm excited. <laughs> so uh, we'll see uh, how the day unfolds in the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you, my friend. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye. All right, good morning again. Well, I've made the long walk up to this corner right behind me. That's that's uh, 12th and North. Across the street, there's a, a stadium, football, baseball. And then uh, this is uh, the old highway right over my shoulder. And that's Mesa University over my shoulder. Anyways, I'm going to walk across the street there and get some breakfast. Then I'll be back over here and do our sermon and say uh, what the Lord has for me today. All right, see you in a little bit. Bye. Morning, my friend welcome to the channel welcome to where am I Grand Junction <laughs> Sorry, my mind went blank Grand Junction Colorado <clears throat> we're in Grand Junction we're at uh, this is uh, North Street uh, it's the old highway that goes through town uh, before Interstate 70 was built this was the original highway the old highway this is the business highway I guess <clears throat> business 70 I guess you call it and right behind the camera here is 12th Street and uh, we're right across from the uh, Lincoln Park Grand Junction uh, Sports Complex. Big football field and a rodeo and, you know, baseball and all that kind of stuff. It's a lot of things going on across the street. Not today, but it happens. And then right behind me here is the entrance to the Colorado Mesa University. CMU, I think. Or is it, yeah, MSU, Mesa University, I don't know, something like that. Mesa University, MSU, I think that's what they call it. Mesa University, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but uh, it's quite large, it's several blocks. Uh, my Airbnb is down there to 7th Street, so it's 12th to 7th and all the way down uh, 7th Street. And uh, so I walk up there and, and the, May, the, color, the university starts way down there, many, many blocks south of here pretty big bigger than I thought it was and it goes for several blocks that way so it's very large very large uh, Colorado has a lot of universities spread throughout the state it's pretty amazing how many uh, universities are in this state I don't know why uh, but that's the way it is I guess uh, people like to come to Colorado and study so I think the one of the better things to do is to come to Colorado and study the Word of God and go out and preach the Word of God. That would be kind of cool. But uh, I don't know of too many Bible schools, though. Not too many of them that I know of. Uh, I know there's some down in Colorado Springs. Uh, you know that. And I'm sure there's others, other places. Took my rubber band off. But uh, I don't know where they are. Now, it looks warm out here, it's 31 degrees with about a five or six mile an hour wind. And so it's, that wind is very icy, but uh, it's a nice day. So uh, let's just start it in prayer. Lord, I thank you that we can come to other cities, we can come to other places that you've called us to. 
that uh, we're willing and we're obedient to go wherever you send us, Lord. You said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So uh, you told me to come to Grand Junction and preach the gospel, and that's what uh, I'm going to do, Lord, because uh, you asked me to, and I'm willing to follow you. I'm willing to be obedient and uh, put myself at risk, put myself in harm's way, and uh, lay my life down and serve you because that's uh, what you've asked me to do. And I know there's many watching who have done the same thing, so I thank you, Lord, that all of us ministers, all of us Christians are not ashamed of the gospel, we're not ashamed of Christ, that we're willing to stand up and voice our testimony to whoever would listen. I thank you, Lord, you've called many out into the field, for the fields white for harvest, Lord. Let them see the whiteness of the fields so they, they're not afraid, they don't see the darkness, they see the white of the field. And so that'll encourage them to go out into that field, wherever they may be. We give you all the glory, Father, for what you're doing here in Grand Junction and wherever people are watching around the world. In your name, Jesus. In your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. So uh, the video might rock back and forth a little bit because I just have this small little tripod. I can't carry my big one on you know, my travel. It's just too much to carry. So I carry this small tripod that uh, Brother in Christ gave me here a couple years ago. Still using it. I use everything that people give me. And if I don't use it, I find somebody else that could use what I can't use. But so far, I use everything that people have been given me to do the ministry. Uh, it's one of those things that, uh, uh, just like my backpack. That backpack is like a, that's just a gift from God as far as I'm concerned. I tell you that. I usually have to, it's just really a trouble, but I was able to travel with my new uh, bag that I got for this year. All right? All right, so let's jump in the Word, I guess. So uh, January 22 Sunday prayer letter, it's called Save Yourselves. Save Yourself. A lot of people think, uh, you know, Jesus is going to save me, so I'm just going to live in sin, and one day He'll save me. You know, but the Bible is pretty clear. Save Yourself, man. Uh, nobody can save you. You have to save yourself. Your dad can't call to Jesus, Lord Jesus, uh, save my son, save my daughter. Well, you know, that's not going to work. They're going to have to call out to Jesus on their own. So your job as a dad or a mom is to train your child in such a way that they'll be open to the gospel. You know, but if you keep dumping all the world in their life, you keep dumping the world, keep dumping trash in their life, the Bible says God's not going to be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So that's probably why parents are reaping from their children all kinds of catastrophe, and they can't figure out why. I'm a good person, they say, and my, uh, my wife is a good person, or the husband say, you know, whatever the case. Why are my children turning out the way they're turning out? Well, it could be, Mom and Dad, that you've been sowing trash in their life since they were consumed, uh, conceived in the womb. And, uh, you know, uh, people don't get that. People don't understand that. <clears throat> They think it's, it's okay to live in the world. They think it's okay. This world is full of sin. Adam and Eve, Adam brought sin into the world. Before Adam brought sin into the world, I'm talking about Adam and Eve, before he brought sin into the world, there was no sin. The world was not sinful. But Satan needed a way into the world and he had to go through man. He needed to go through man to destroy this world, God's creation. And uh, he was tested and he failed. Adam failed the test. He flunked. He got a great big red F on his report card. How about that? And we all have to pay the price. So when mom and dad, when you get Fs on your report card as parents, guess what? You have to pay the price of your children not being around. My mom uh, lived a lonely life because she sowed sin into our lives, all of our adult life, grow, our children's life growing up. She sowed sin, and my dad sowed sin in our lives, and they couldn't figure out why their children, their three children, wouldn't hang around them. You know, us three kids would hang around because we're pretty similar. But we didn't want to hang around mom and dad. Why? Because they sowed sin in our lives, and that sin kept us separated. All of us received Jesus Christ. Our mom and dad refused Christ. My brother and my sister are saved. I'm saved. But my mom and dad never got saved. They just rejected Christ the whole time. 
and uh, that's just life, right? Yeah, life. And uh, some parents receive Christ and their children don't. Some children receive Christ and their parents don't. You know, the uh, Bible says two will be in bed, one taken, one left. There'll be two out in the field, one left, one taken. You know, uh, two people walking down the aisleway in Safeway store, grocery store. One taken, one left, holding the cart. Where'd he go? You know, I mean, I don't know. There's all kinds of things going to happen. A lot of times we don't understand how God operates. That's why we always have to fast and pray. Jesus told his, his apostles during that great night uh, that he knew he was going to be, uh, you know, a lot of problems going to happen. He's going to die that night, that morning, actually, uh, or next day. Uh, he said, can't you watch with me one hour? And you watch with watch and pray with me one hour. He asked him three times or twice the third time. You know, finally says, don't worry about it. It's time. There will be a time that says you can't pray no more. No more time to pray. Because that's what Jesus told his apostles. Can't pray anymore. P prayer's done. We got to go to the next event. Got to go to the next season of my life here on earth. You know? There's so many seasons in life and we don't understand different seasons in our life. A lot of people take the seasons that God gave you and you spend that season serving the world. And you're not ready for the next season that's coming. There's like, this is winter right now. I am prepared for springtime. I'm looking around, I'm getting, making sure I'm gonna be ready for spring, okay? For spring. And I'll be ready for summer. You know, I was writing some notes down the Airbnb, trying to get ready for my next trip. You know, it'll be springtime. I want to make sure I've got some certain tools with me in the springtime. I'm preparing now in this season for the next season. Are you doing that? David said, Lord, teach us to number our days. Number our days is the same as saying, Lord, teach us how to live in the season that you have us in so that we can be prepared for the f next season coming. So there's a season coming that is not like any season that's ever been on planet Earth or in the heavens above, never. Jesus said, no man has ever seen what's gonna be coming. But right now we are in this season of grace and the reason we're in the season of grace is to prepare ourselves for that great and dreadful day of the Lord that's gonna come. Are you preparing yourself or are you just living your life, la di da, having fun? I ministered to a lot of people on the train. You know, I was a witness. I had a guy come up to me the last hour of the train, maybe 45 minutes of the train ride. I said, do you mind if I sit down and talk to you? I said, sure. I closed my computer down and I talked to him for 45 minutes or thereabouts till I got off the train in Grand Junction. Here. He says, uh, I like to see, this is what he told me. He said, I like to study people. I like to look to people. So I was walking through the train looking for the most unique book. He said, people are like a book. So I was looking, walking through the train looking for the most unique book. Okay? And I was okay. And he said, of all the people on the train, you are the most unique book. That's why I wanted to sit down and talk with you. You stood out from everybody on the train. There was nobody like you on the train. I said, well, okay, <laughs> is that I can tell that you are serious about Jesus. I said, yeah, I'm pretty serious about Jesus, <laughs> you know? And we talked and talked, and uh, he asked me some very, very intricate, very serious, very life-altering, life-changing questions. And I praise God that the Holy Ghost came at that table that where we were sitting at, and ministered to both of us. I was listening as I was talking. I'm going, wow, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Where did that come? I was like mesmerized on what I was saying and the tonality I was speaking and the attitude I was speaking from and the mindset that I was speaking to him. It was spectacular. And I know there were people behind me listening, people behind him listening, people on the side, people were listening. And he was, he, uh, he was uh, pretty surprised. I was surprised at what went on at the table. And then as the conductor called Grand Junction, we said, well, I need, I said, let's pray. We need to pray now. 
And uh, so we bowed our heads at the table, right in front of everybody. And it got quiet in the train at that, because we were in the observation, the you know, train, wherever it's called, you know, with the glass ceiling and all. And it got quiet when we began to pray. I noticed that. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless you, man. And so we prayed, and his wife was sitting back there a couple of chairs. And I know, she, I couldn't see her, but I know she was watching like crazy. She was really intent on watching us. And it was a spectacular prayer. I don't know what I said. I don't know what I prayed. And uh, we got up, shook hands. I put my backpack on, and I left the train. I left his life. I'll probably never see him again the rest of my life. I've traveled all my life. And what I've noticed that in my years and decades of traveling, if I don't give somebody everything they need, there could be a Bible verse that says their blood could be on my hands. So I make sure that they have everything they need to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's what I do when I'm traveling. When I'm traveling, get that, when I'm traveling, okay? Because I've traveled, like I said, all my life. I started traveling when I was probably 10 years old with my dad. And then when I was 13, I had my first motorcycle, I began traveling. By the time I was 18 years old, I'd already traveled over 100,000 miles on my motorcycle. All over, you know, Western Canada, the United, Western United States. And then I went into the military and traveled around the world, made 14 cruises on board ship. Then I got out of the Navy and I bought myself a tractor and trailer rig and I traveled another 3 million miles. Along inside all that, I traveled to 23 countries around the world. I have been around the world many times and I've done things that a lot of people never can even imagine. I've been in jungles, I've been in bamboo forests, I've been out in the desert, I've been on mountaintops, I've been in valleys, I've been in cities, I've been in gut districts that are so evil. I've been in gang areas that are so wicked and so evil. But guess what I was always doing? I was always preaching Jesus Christ as the only way to heaven. The only way to heaven, because too many people I talk to think there's another way to heaven. And when they meet me, they're going, well, preacher, you're saying something different than my church says. That's what this guy was telling me about. His church told him a, a different way to get to Jesus. I said, well, that's not the right way. <laughs> and uh, he asked me, how do I get to Jesus? Because he was kind of on, you know, I don't know. He was asking questions. And uh, he didn't give me a good answer when I asked him, if you died tonight, do you have the assurance in your heart that you'd go to heaven? So, you know, he didn't know the real answer. Eventually, after he told me his answer, I said, well, this is the right answer. I tell people the right answer. I said, like an open book test. I give them a test, and then if I don't, I don't, you know, whatever they say, whatever they say, and then I give them the answer. This is the answer to the question I just asked. I don't give them the answer until they give me their answer. Then I know how to give them the right answer. And typically, not all the time, but the answer that I give them is not the answer they gave me. If they die, would they go to heaven? Okay. And so these are just examples that no matter where you're going, no matter what you're doing, now get this too. I'm not telling people to quit your job, quit your schooling, quit everything you're doing, quit your family, and go serve the Lord. No, Jesus didn't tell us to do that. You're to keep your job, keep your business. Look, God told you something different. I mean, don't, you know. But he said, occupy till I return. Occupy. That means wherever God puts you, you occupy that place. If you're going to Mesa University here, then you occupy as a student. But as, you're, as a student, you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, if you're a truck driver like I was, you preach the gospel as you being a truck driver. You know, that's what you do. Yeah. Whatever your, God says, whatever, wherever I put your hand to, you know, that's where I want you. So my hand was on the steering wheel of my truck, for example, or somebody could be going to this university or Mesa, and God put their hand on a book, a textbook, go to school, and they, they got to go to school. 
you know. But while you're doing this type of occupation, occupying, you preach and minister the gospel of God everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. Because what Satan does not want you to do, he doesn't mind you going to school, he doesn't mind getting in a truck, driving down the highway, he doesn't mind getting a job as a baseball player or a football player or McDonald's or T-Mobile, you know, he doesn't mind those jobs. Satan does, what he minds, what Satan minds is when you open your mouth for Jesus. He wants to shut it. He wants to put duct tape across your mouth, duct tape across your eyes, so you're blind and mute. Then he puts duct tape on your ears so you can't hear. And uh, that's what Satan does. But you have to rebuke Satan. You have to cast him out of your life. You have to tell the enemy to leave in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you got to go about the Lord's business. That's what Jesus says. I'm about my, when he told his, his mom says, where have you been? He says, I, I'm about my father's business. You know, how about that? Are you about your father's business? You know, if a, if a mother or dad asks their child, where have you been? Are you going to say, I've been about my father's business, my heavenly father's business? Or are you going to say, oh, I've been sleeping around, or I've been doing alcohol, I've been drinking, I've been drunk, or I've been doing drugs, or I just, I slept with my boyfriend. A lot of high school students sleeping around. A lot of high school students doing wicked, evil stuff. And a lot of those students are Christians in Christian homes. And mom and dad don't know what's going on with their child. Junior high, grammar school, you'd be surprised what's going on in grammar schools in some of these cities around America. You'd be surprised. You'd be totally shocked when I talk to believers who only go to a church building, that's all they know about Christ, going to a church building, and I tell them some of the things that go on that, that students talk to me about, they are literally blown away. They just, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, because you're hiding in some building. You're not out in the world ministering to people. You're in that private little club hiding just exactly what Satan wants you to do, hide. So, I'm not hiding. I'm out here in this great big intersection. I've had some students walk by me. I've had some people yell at me while I'm doing the video. Oh well, oh well, oh well, right? Oh well. <laughs> oh well. All right, January 22nd, Sunday prayer letter, Save Yourselves, is found in Acts chapter 2, verse 40. And we're in a theme called Signs, Wonders, Miracles, prayer, Praise, and Worship. You know, a lot of people get turned off immediately when a ministry mentions miracles. How sad, right? That's how Jesus' ministry, that's how we knew who Jesus was, by the signs and wonders and miracles that Jesus did. It says, if you don't believe me, believe the miracles that God does, the Father does. You know, there was a back and forth there. I'm kind of, that sun's going across the, the uh, signal light there. I hope to stay here to about five o'clock or so. I hope to get about six or seven hours, seven hours in on the street here. Uh, sometimes it gets so busy, I, I move across over there to the other side of this, uh, the intersection here, and there's a big old, uh, knee, a big old bright light up there. And many times uh, I've stood under that bright light for another hour or two. It's been really great. Really great, really great. Really great. Anyways, let's go on here. So Acts chapter 2, verse 40. Uh, we already read that. 20. So we have seven parts in our letter here. And this is part two on Monday, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We're going through all these verses. And uh, if you want to read my Sunday prayer letter in its totality, you can go to our website. And uh, gospelofvangelistchurch.org or John C H O Q U E dot O R G, and you can see the Sunday prayer letter there. And or you know get the email, you know preacherjohn.ck.page. Get the email. I tell people get the email, even if you don't read it, because when the, you see my name in your inbox or in your email, that'll trigger a thought. Hey, I need to pray for for preacher John out there in Colorado. 
or, or in Colorado, wherever you're at. But, uh, you know, I don't know. Whatever. People do what they got to do. Okay? <clears throat> So once again, the theme is signs, wonders, miracles, praise, worship, okay? And that's what we're, that's what we're talking about, okay? Let me go down here now to 42. We're going to read 42, and that's all we're going to talk on, 42. And uh, we're going to talk on one verse per day. <clears throat> Yesterday, Sunday, I talked on verse 40 and 41. Uh, in fact, let me just do 40 real quick. Uh, and with many other words did Peter, <clears throat> did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. <clears throat> okay? So that's where I got the title at, verse 40. Okay, save yourself. Let me read 41. Then they that gladly received his word, remember that, gladly received the word of God, were baptized in the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. All right, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So, as you know, I teach people or I tell people or I talk to people about reading the Bible as a contract or as a testimony or as a testament, a will, instead of a novel. So many people read it so fast they actually speed read the Word of God and uh, a lot of them say, I don't really know what the Word of God says. And I ask people, how do you read it? Let me show you, show me how you read the Bible. And they just, blah, 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 oh my goodness. I mean, they just rattle off the Word of God. You know, and I'm going, oh man, slow down a little bit. You know, so let's slow down and talk about this one single little tiny verse out of the 31,102 Bible verses in the King James. We'll just talk about the one. Not the one. I may have to move because that sun's going right across, the, right in front of that uh, uh, signal light there. <laughs> the, the moment it, you stand in the shade, it drops like 10 degrees. I mean, you can tell it immediately. Uh, I don't know. I guess I'll stand right here. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Okay? All right, let's go to 42. And they continued steadfastly. They, who? Now, the question I had before the Lord, when, they, when, the, when you mentioned they, I asked the Lord, when you mentioned they, are you referring to the all 3,000 or are you referring back to the 120? And oftentimes, I hear the 120. The 120. Because the 120 is really important, the 120 who received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they all began, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. Okay? When I was filled with the Holy Ghost, I began to speak with other tongues. Actually, I didn't speak with other tongues. I spoke with new tongues. A new tongue. Anyways, that's another teaching there. A lot of people don't get that, but that's okay. So, if we just look at the 120 and not the 3,000, and they, oh no, and they, the 120, continued. Jesus says, you love me, keep my commandments. The word keep is the word continue. The word keep is the word live. The word keep is to dwell, to make your abode, make your home in the word of God. In the word of God. God bless you guys. <laughs> Hi. Keep it in the word of God. Huh? No, I'm just, yeah, I'm just doing a video. No, you're doing good, man. You're doing good. Am I okay? Okay. So anyways, uh, they, so that, we're talking about the 120, okay? And they that gladly, okay, it's done at 42, and they continue. So the word continued is really important. A lot of people do not continue. They read it one time and then they quit. Uh, they go to a ministry one time, they quit. They go to Bible school and they quit after they get out of Bible school. Or they start Bible school and then they quit. People don't continue. They start college and they don't continue through college and graduate. They quit. So many students quit. So many parents quit. So many people quit all the time. They're always quitting. Starting something new. They start a marriage and they quit. They start a family, then they quit. They don't know how to continue. They don't know how to continue. 
You know, that's why I stand out so much because, I, man, John, you're still doing what you're doing. Yeah, I continue in the Lord. Why not? I'm going to continue in the Lord till I go home, till I go to heaven. You know, that, and that's why the Holy Ghost uses me, I guess. Been preaching for a long time, and I'm still being used by God. How about that? How many preachers are not being used by God anymore? Yeah, how many? You know, at least I bet there's at least one somewhere in the world who are not being used by God anymore. Why? Because they have not continued in the Word of God. They have not continued. It says right here, and they continued, and sometimes to continue, you have to do this next word here, and that is steadfastly, steadfastly. Man, you have to stand fast. To make fast is to tighten the bolt down. To make fast. When we were in the military, uh, on board ship, we would have to make fast the anchor. Make fast the anchor. Because we are a Navy ship. And so we would make sure the anchor was solidly dug into the sand or the mud that the ship was harbored into. Because we don't want an anchor to drag because the ship could land up on the beach. So we would post an anchor watch, an anchor watch, 24 hours a day, an anchor watch, to make sure that the anchor stood steadfast in the mud, in the sand, in the ground. And so how do you have a watch, an anchor watch in your life? Do you have an anchor watch in your life? Or are you just uh, all by yourself? All by yourself. So I'm going to talk about how to have an anchor watch in your life. There's a, is inside this verse here. God bless you too, man. <laughs> have a great day. <laughs> mom, see there's a mom and a dad and their students going to school. They said, God bless you. They all were believers. Their parents were. Everybody was. Hadn't that something? Here I'm talking about parents and students going to school. How about that, right? <laughs> all right, steadfastly. Verse 30, 42, and they continued steadfastly, steadfastly. That's why Jesus says, I am the rock. That's why the rock followed them in the wilderness that gave them the lit water. The water came from the rock that followed them in the wilderness. How does the rock follow the, I don't know. Anyways, uh, man, I got, hang on a second. I got to put my gloves on. It is so cold. Sorry, <laughs> glove break, <laughs> it's just cold. <clears throat> A lot of people say, oh, it's so nice out here. Yeah, we'll stand out here for another hour or two and tell me. <laughs> All right, so anyways. All right, <clears throat> and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. All right, the Apostles' Doctrine. I want to talk about that for a minute. Steadfastly in the Doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. All right, the Apostles' Doctrine, the Apostles' Teaching. Do you think, let me, let me ask you a question. Do you think that the Apostles of Jesus Christ were teaching corruption? Do you think they were teaching sin? Do you think they were teaching how to have a great life now on earth? Do you think they were teaching how to get a better job? Do you think they were teaching how to, how to have a smile on your face? How to, uh, how to eat healthy? How, I mean, what were they teaching on? They were teaching the Word of God. They were preaching the Word of God. They were ministering the Word of God. Now, you have to understand that they were ministering the Word of God, but there was no New Testament written at that time. They, were ju they just had the Old Testament. Fortunately, at that time, uh, they had a pure Word of God, right? Pure Word of God, right? God watched, you know, pure Word of God. The Apostles' Doctrine, all right? The Apostles' Doctrine. So, nowadays, you know, once the New Testament is written, do we still follow the Apostles' Doctrine or a Preacher's Doctrine or a Minister's Doctrine? Well, it's okay as long as that doctrine is found in the King James Bible. I'm going to say that because doctrines today come out of corrupt Bibles. Some churches, they don't even tell you what kind of version they talk on. People don't realize there's nearly a thousand English Bibles that have been printed since 1881. 
900 and some. Most of them aren't in print anymore, okay? They don't tell you what Bible they're preaching out of because every Bible, every modern textual critical Bible has a different doctrine, okay? So if you're following a preacher, following a minister, sorry I'm yelling, it's really noisy out here. You're following a preacher, an apostle, whatever, a teacher, a minister, a pastor, you have to check their doctrine nowadays. Here, they didn't have to check the doctrine. Later on, you see that Paul, when he was preaching, uh, because he was writing and sending letters out to all the churches and he was teaching in the churches he, that he was establishing, uh, that people would check the scriptures to make sure that Paul was preaching the truth because they knew the truth, okay? They were free. They weren't enslaved to a corrupt doctrine. And believe me, when Paul was preaching, there was corrupt doctrine. All right? So, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So the best way, actually, actually, is to be steadfast in the doctrine of the Word of God. And I would prefer you stay in the King James Bible, the authorized 1611, 1611 authorized version. All right. And nowadays, when you buy a King James Bible, you have to check the printer and make sure that printer uh, doesn't alter the text. So if you buy a Zondervan, or how do you pronounce that, Zondervan King James, they, Zondervan will tell you we have altered the text. Yeah. So you have to check the printer, make sure you're buying a Bible from a printer who is, is not altering the text. The reason they can alter that text is because the copyright for the King James is no longer in force. It's held by the Crown Copyright. And that was, the last time they enforced that was around, uh, was 300 years ago. <laughs> it's an old Bible, it's an old book. <clears throat> okay, they enforced it for the first 100 years and after that they stopped. So it's important, okay? Anyways, <clears throat> man. And they continue steadfastly in the apostle's doctrine. Okay, let's go on. And fellowship, fellowship. We're talking about fellowship. So fellowship is to hang around, to be a fellow of. Ship is to gather together. You know, fellowship, to hang out, to be friends with. Are you friends with the world? Or are you friends with believers? It says, the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked. Don't, don't be one, don't have friends that are living for Satan and you think that you're gonna be their friend and you're gonna do what they do because you think on your own, your own brain, that you're gonna save them. It ain't gonna happen. You need to hang out with believers powerful, strong, dedicated, committed, disciplined believers. <clears throat> because in today's world, there are believers who are not disciplined. They don't know what's going on in the body of Christ. They don't know. They may say they're a Christian, but then when you see they're acting, God bless you, man. Yeah. What's that? All the Lord, yeah. I'm actually doing a sermon right now on YouTube. 
<laughs> they probably didn't hear you because <laughs> you're talking pretty quiet. I can barely hear you. <laughs> so the Bible says every idle word will be judged. You know, you're here, you're, God's recording it right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, keep him in prayer, okay? Because you know, he needs to be saved, you know? Yeah, God bless you. All right, sir. God bless you too, sir. God bless. <laughs> I don't know if you heard what just went on there, but the guy there in the wheelchair, he was over there across the street in that telephone place, and uh, he didn't like the guy who was waiting on him, and so he, this is a typical Christian. This is an everyday, normal Christian. And so he was over there, and he told that guy off. He said blankety blank, he used a bunch of curse words right here, what he told him. Did he return evil? Because the man in the store gave him evilness. He gave him, you know, he didn't help him out. So, but he returned that evil was not good. The Bible says return it with good. He returned that evil with evil. And he brought that evil over here and confessed the evil that he had done. See, that's how believers live. Are they steadfastly Continuing in the doctrine of the Word of God? Nope. I, I just I told him every other word. Oh, now I didn't say anything bad. He can't even hear. People don't even know they're sinning. Christians don't even know it. That's why we preach to Christians also, because so many Christians don't even believe, don't even realize that they're sinning. Christians, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> Hallelujah! I'm glad I'm here because this witness was a uh, testimony to him and a conviction. He started talking about his mom. Anyways, but you, you know, so if you were here, maybe you could have took him, I mean, I don't know, you would have done something different. You know, you can't judge me and say, oh, I would have done this, John, or I would have done that. I mean, you can't do that, man. Why judge me? Are you out here preaching? Are you out here ministering? If you were, then you could say, John, you could have done this, and I would have listened to you. But if you're at home, or you're in a car, and you're judging me, because you watch this, and you see what I did there, you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on here. So keep your judgment to yourself. You know, come out and preach with me, you know? Oh, I can't do that. I got a job. Oh, well, on your day off, come out. I preach six days a week. You work seven, you work seven days a week. There's got to be one of the days of the week that you're not working in your day off. I'm sure that you don't work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Oh, well, nobody comes out because they're busy with the world. That's okay. I'm just telling you like it is, okay? A lot of people don't like that. They don't like that. They, they want to do what they want to do. But it says here, and they continue. So I want to talk about more about they again before I go any further. Really important to get who they were. I'm talking about the 120. But listen to this. When I remember what I was asking, was it the 120 that they continued? Or was it the 3,000 you just added that day that continued? So I heard the 120. But get this, the Lord also said, go back up a couple of verses and read it. I said, all right. So I went back when I was having breakfast down there. And it says here, and uh, let's see, uh, verse 41. And they that gladly received his word. He said, that's the people who steadfastly continued in the apostles' doctrine. The ones who gladly received the word of God. Gladly. Not be, like I gave him the word of God, but he didn't gladly receive it. He wouldn't have, he doesn't stay in. That's a good example. He didn't gladly receive the word of God. I said, every idle word will be judged. Oh, not my words. I didn't do anything wrong. Immediately, self-defense. Even though I witnessed the, a Bible verse being violated. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he violated one of Jesus' commandments. I told him, oh no, not me. So he didn't gladly receive the word of God. You see that? 
And when I tell people certain things and I read the Bible to them, they say, oh, I, I don't believe that. Oh, that's your interpretation, John. I said, it says it right there. It's not my interpretation. It's black and white. Oh, no, that's not what it said. That's not what it says. That's what I just read. That's not what it says. See, their bl eyes are blinded to the truth. Their ears are stopped to the hearing of the Word of God. Their heart is hardened to the Word of God. They can't receive it gladly. That's why I pray for people to have eyes to see, ears to hear. Jesus said that a lot, but also have a heart to understand. Oh, this sermon's going to go on and on and on. I, I thought this was going to be a short sermon. <laughs> it's going to keep on going for a minute. Anyways, the they that continued are the ones who gladly receive the Word of God. Gladly. You're watching this here and you're watching me read the Bible. Are you gladly receiving the Word of God? When you read some of the comments below the video, you'll see that some do not receive the Word gladly. I delete a lot. I have to check every comment because I'm held accountable by YouTube for everybody's comments. I'm held accountable. So I make sure I read every comment before it's posted so everybody can see it. And sometimes I read very nasty, foul comments. And a lot of comments are deleted even before they get to me because I have a lot of blocked words, a lot of blocked links, a lot of blocking I have already in the system because I already know that Satan doesn't like what I'm doing. And those people who follow after Satan, they use, Satan uses them to attack us. So I put up roadblocks. I put up checkpoints. Checkpoint. Show me your papers. <laughs> Checkpoint Charlie. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> All right. So, uh, boy, it's going to be a great day out here. Great day. <clears throat> gladly receive his word. Okay, so the, the they are the ones who gladly receive the word. And so the Lord continued. The third party said, so of the 3,000, he said, of the 3,000, some of those gladly receive the word. I said, wow, not all 3,000 received the word. All 3,000 got baptized. All 3,000 I added to the church that day. But many are called, few are chosen. Many fall away. It's just the way it is. Narrow is the gate, broad is the way. At least, you know, it's the inner end of the straight gate, the narrow little gate. Jesus says, how hard is it for a camel? How hard is it for a rich man to enter the eye of the needle? Eye of the needle was when the gate was closed, there was a little doorway, so they don't have to open the great big gates to the door, to the, uh, to the uh, city, because all cities were walled, they had big gates. So the eye of the needle was a small gate that, you know, like four, four feet or so, that you kind of walk into the gate, that's just a door. And so camels, uh, camels can crawl or walk on their knees. Camels are really tall, really tall. But they can get on their knees and they can go through the eye of the needle, the whole the doorway inside the gate. And so he said, a rich man can't do that. A rich man won't bow down. A rich man won't get on his knees and go through the, but you know, and a lot of people say, oh, that's rich in this. It's called, some Christians are so rich in the word of God, they are so puffed up with pride and they have built so many barns filled with knowledge that they can't get into the door, they can't get into that little gateway, straight as the gate, they can't get in there because they've got all this knowledge. So what do you do with all that knowledge, Christian? You give it away. Jesus told the rich man, he said, give it away, sell it all, give it to the poor, give it away and come and follow me. So if you're just reading your Bible and reading your Bible and studying and studying for year after year after year after year, that's what you're doing. You're building bigger barns inside of you. Woe is you, because today your soul is going to be required of you. And you're going to find out, you, you're saved, but you're going to find out that you've got nothing to show for yourself. Nothing. Your account is empty other than you. Oh well. So people like me are trying to get you to go do something. Paul talked about that. It's not about me. It's about your account. The reason I want you to go to work for the Lord is not for me. It's for you. So you'll have a reward when Jesus comes. His reward will be with them. 
you know? God is a just God. He rewards everybody for what they do. But if you don't do anything, there's nothing he can reward you with. We don't know what the reward is. I mean, we speculate, but we don't know for sure. Oh, man. I'm going to move you over here because i got to get out of this shade. It is so frigid cold. Hang on. Here you go. Here you go. I'm going to walk over here. And I'm going to stand over here. How's this? Kind of crooked? Uh, what am I going to do here? Sorry, i just got to stand. The sh well, you're kind of crooked there. How's that? I don't know. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, let me see. Oh, hang on. I just got to get in the sh sun. <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, I don't know how that looks, but uh, I got to get in the sun here because it is so cold. How's that? That's kind of goofy there, I know. Sorry. Uh, let me think. Let me do this. Uh, all right. Anyway, sorry. I'm out on the street. This isn't a green screen. I'm not in some church building preaching a sermon behind a pulpit, all dressed up in a nice suit with everybody in their nice suits and dresses and smelling nice. I'm out here on the street. Freezing. <laughs> Hang on a second. I got to blow my nose. Man, sorry. <laughs> now you're kind of crooked, but we'll finish the video and then. Oh, it's so much nicer in the sun. Oh man, it's cold in that shade. I mean, it's just a two feet of shade, but that two feet is like feels like 20 degrees colder, and now it feels 20 degrees warmer. Now it's hot. <laughs> Anyways, uh, okay, so let's finish up here. This beard. I am fasting my shaving because I'm believing for a breakthrough for our street ministry and our missionary church. So I'm fasting my shaving. The beard is not for cosmetics. Just letting you know, a lot of people wear, a lot of men wear facial hair to look cool. I don't, don't need to look cool. I don't need to look cool. I don't need, no, need to look cool. I need to do what God tells me to do. Verse 42, And they, they that gladly received the word of God continued steadfastly anchored with an anchor watch. Anchor watch would be accountability. Accountability. That's why I like these videos because you can kind of keep me in check. This is kind of like an accountability. Am I doing okay here? I can't tell because I don't, can't tell. I, uh, these cameras, I can't see if I'm in focus or I'm uh, in frame or what what's going on so I'll just keep talking here so if I'm out and out of frame sorry <laughs> just doing the best I can here by myself I don't have a crew and they continue steadfastly in the positive doctrine and fellowship hang out with believers committed those who gladly receive the Word of God that's how you can check if should I hang out with them you ask them do you gladly receive the Word of God well you know once they say that okay thank you very much so you find a believer who says, yes, I gladly receive the Word of God. Good, can I be your friend? You know, it's an idea. Oh, I forgot, across the street they give you the, oh, it's 35 degrees now. 25 in the shade, 35 in the sun. <laughs> All right, let's continue here. And, uh, and in breaking of bread, so breaking of bread, uh, kind of interesting when I was reading that this morning, uh, he said a lot of people think breaking of bread is communion. He said it's not, not in this context. He said read down a few verses and you'll find out the breaking of bread was having meat. Meat was having dinner or lunch or breakfast, whatever. Okay? It wasn't the Lord's Supper, you know, the communion, the bread and the wine. Or grape juice, whatever you guys have. Whatever. <clears throat> Fruit of the vine. And the breaking of bread and in prayers. The Lord highlighted the word prayers. I said, wow. They, they continue steadfastly in prayers. In prayers. I'm all about praying. You see me on the videos pray. I always pray. Constantly pray. I, try, I, look, I was looking for an opportunity to pray for the guy here in the wheelchair. But there was no opportunity presented. So I can't force myself on somebody. So I don't pray for him. But I wanted to pray for him. But... I didn't see an opportunity. He was shut down, closed-minded. He wanted to curse. 
It's all right. You know. He asked the answer to God, not to Preacher John. I'm just a, another servant out here on the streets of Grand Junction, 12th and uh, North. <laughs> all right. Great day. <clears throat> all right. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly in fellowship. They continued steadfastly in the breaking of bread. And they continued steadfastly in prayers. When believers get together and they don't pray, I would strongly suggest, number one, first, ask them, how come you guys don't pray? You'd be surprised what they may say. Oh, I didn't think about it. Oh, pray. Oh, now? I pray all the time. Jesus said, my house will be called the house of prayer. What's the rest of that verse? I, usually that's all I say. They said, you, the supposed believers, have made it a den of thieves. Is that what you're doing to your body? Have you made your body a den of thieves? Have you made your church a den of thieves? You know, you go to a, a church who's having a conference, and as soon as the... Uh, speaker that comes to the conference what's the first thing the conference speaker usually says oh i have books in the book table back there and he rattles off all of his books and all of his courses and all the stuff selling 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 don't be bashful spend your money don't be bashful spend your money i don't want to take any books home with me i've heard it all that just turns my stomach they've made it that church building a den of thieves but they rationalize oh it's okay they're Christian books. But I don't hear any prayers going on. I hear a little prayer maybe in the beginning. Maybe, maybe, not always. And maybe a little prayer in the in front. But I don't hear a lot of prayers. I don't hear a lot of prayers. Gospel of Andrews Church is a house of prayer. We pray before, during, and after. We pray. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> We pray all the time. We leave church, we pray. We come to church, we pray. Gospel of Andrews Church is called by God a house of prayer. The street corner is called a, a house of prayer. I pray and preach all day long. All day long. All day long. God bless you, sir. This guy here just walked by. This is the fourth year I've seen him. He's got a new coat, but he's still carrying his, his water bucket. Isn't that great? Still gets a witness, but he won't say hello to me. Maybe next year. I'll be back here next year. I'll be coming here for 10 years. I put about 20 hours or so on the street per year here. So 10 years, that's 200 hours of preaching at this exact location. 200 hours I'll put in here in Grand Junction. What's going to happen in 200 hours in just this one city? Have you put 200 hours in the cities that you're going to? I mean, it takes time to put in 200 hours. It doesn't happen overnight. But I've got a 10-year plan. It might take me 11 or 12 years to get the 10-year plan done. But so what? So what? So what? If it takes me 20 years to get a 10-year plan done, so what? Does it matter? No. As long as I keep moving, as long as I keep serving, God's going to help me. You know? Not every day. You know, sometimes I only put in 19 hours, but then sometimes I'll put 21 hours. Sometimes 17 hours because of troubles and problems. But I try for 20. And sometimes 25. You know? Oh, man. Hallelujah. Let's finish up this long-winded talk. All right. And they that gladly received the word continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly in fellowship. And they that gladly received the word continued steadfastly in breaking of bread. And they that gladly received the word continued steadfastly in prayers. So there's four check marks that you can look. You can write those four areas down. 
Number one would be, do you gladly receive the word of God? Then one, two, three, four. So basically five, but a heading would be, glad. do I gladly receive the word? Then the doctrine, the word of God. And then uh, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. You can check those off. Give yourself, be accountable. You save yourself. You save yourself by being accountable to yourself. Be accountable. You know, I keep records. I'm accountable on my calendar. I keep records. I keep tally of all my hours, my tracks, my cards, how much I give to the poor, how many souls I've witnessed to, how many don't, how much donation I've received. It's really crazy. Uh, you know, I keep tax of my donation too. I get, I get donations about every day. So when donations to me means a penny. I find pennies on the ground. I don't walk by the pennies. I pick them up. Guess what Chase Bank does? Oh, you found that penny on the ground. We don't take those pennies. Chase Bank says, no, I, we, I'll take the penny. I said, these pennies I found on the ground. Will you take them? Yes, we'll take them. And they put it in the church account. How about that, right? All the money goes in the church. It doesn't go into my account. All goes in the church account. Bunch of mockers walking across the street. They they know what they're doing. They think I don't know what I'm doing. Anyways, uh, so I get getting off the train. I had collected a, a, a offering that day. You know, and I don't ask for offerings, but uh, uh, I'm going. I had to go back to my coach car, my coach seat, and uh, get my backpack, get all my gear, and right there in the seat was a quarter. I said I told the lady. Uh, that was sitting beside me. I said, oh, my first offering for the day. And she laughs. They think it's funny. I said, that quarter is important to me. That's God telling me that I'm going to take care of you. Now, people can laugh at that 25 cents you collected. Yeah, I'm excited for 25 cents. You should listen to what Jesus said when somebody gave one penny. He stopped everybody and said, listen. This woman has given everything she has. I could almost hear people say, yeah, but it was only a penny. It was only a quarter, it was only a nickel. Yeah, but that was all she had. That was exciting because that was all the money that was laying on that seat. So whoever was sitting there left a quarter. A quarter must have fell out of their pocket between the seats. Nobody was there, they had already, everybody got off the train. And I was excited. I told them, I said, listen, I just collected a quarter for the ministry. I got excited. A couple of people said, kind of crazy, kind of quarter. I'm excited about pennies, nickels, and dimes and quarters. It's not the amount. It's that somebody gave. So I prayed for the people who left the quarter. That's what I did. I didn't get off the train. I said, Lord, I just thank you for these people who left the quarter for me. Lord, I'm going to take that quarter and put it in the ministry put it to work in the ministry. I'm going to put it to work. So our Lord bless them. Let them know that they sow the seed a quarter today. Young couple that was sitting there. Looks like they just got married. I don't know where they were going. Anyways, let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we can collect a quarter. We can collect a penny or a dime. We can move from the shade to the sun. We can stand in the light. We can lift the word of God. We can preach out loud in the street corner here in America. As long as we're not on private property, we can preach without any trouble whatsoever. You stand on private property. Don't let people stand on private property, Lord. Private property is what that just exactly what that means, private property. But we can stand on public property and preach the Word of God. So, Lord, I thank you that I can preach the Word of God out here in the public intersection of 12th and North in Grand Junction, and people hear and see the Word of God. Lord, help them to understand the Word of God. And Lord, I pray that people will gladly receive the Word of God as this ministry goes forth today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. All right, man, uh, that's the prayer, right? We pray in the beginning, right now. Thank you for being here, man. I love you very much. You take care, all right?